الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه المجيد وفرقانه الحميد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والفجر وليال عشر والشفع والوتر والليل إذا يسر هل في ذلك قسم لذي حجر ألم تر كيف فعل ربك بعاد إرم ذات العماد التي لم يخلق مثلها في البلاد وثمود الذين جابوا الصخر بالواد وفرعون ذي الأوتاد الذين طغوا في البلاد فأكثروا, في فأكثروا فيها الفساد فصب عليهم ربك صوت عذاب إن ربك رب من صاد فأما الإنسان إذا مبتلاه ربه فأكرمه ونعمه فيقول ربي أكرما وأما إذا مبتلاه فقدر عليه رزقه فيقول ربي أهانا كلا بل لا تكرمون اليتيم ولا تحاضون على طعام المسكين وتأكلون التراث أكلا لما وتحبون المال حبا جما كلا إذا دكت الأرض دكا دكا وجاء ربك والملك صفا صفا وجاء يومئذ بجهنم يومئذ يتذكر الإنسان وأن له الذكرى يقول يا ليتني قدمت لحياتي فيومئذ لا يعذب عذابه أحد ولا يوثق وثاقه أحد يا أيتها النفس المطمئنة ارجعي إلى ربك راضية مرضية فادخلي في عبادي وادخلي جنتي سلوات Most of our age, Imam Zamana, my respected elders, brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Our discussions so far have taken us to a number of directions and levels. Firstly, our discussion was that we want to look at this entire chapter of Surah Al-Fajr in light of the movement of the Master of the Martyrs, Aba Abdullah al Hussein, salawatullah wa salamu alayhi. And that is based upon one of the traditions that comes to us in which our sixth Imam salam tells us to recite this chapter in our obligatory and in our additional prayers. For he who does so will insha'Allah be erased with the master of the martyrs on the day of judgment in that very same level of paradise with him. And then we have stated that the Quran has a number of levels and we have been looking at the various levels. We looked at the oath and how an oath can have various levels and degrees to it. And we mentioned yesterday, for example, that when it comes to these oaths, they have a number of ideas as to what these oaths may represent. As we peel back the layers, as we dive into the ocean that is the Qur'an, we find that these particular oaths by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have a number of meanings. For example, at a very face value meaning, we found that wal fajr, I swear by the dawn, can be literally the dawn, being the period of the day in which you and I raise for Salat al-Fajr. But at another level, the traditions tell us that this is about the movement of Karbala and that these 10 days are specific to the 10 days of Muharram. And therefore that this dawn is the dawn of the movement of Hussein ibn Ali alayhi salam. And that being the case, we look at all of the other oaths in light of that particular movement and can come to various conclusions about what this departure of the night is. And the reality that the departure of the night is the departure of the age of ignorance. The departure of that ignorance that was lasting over that community at that time. And ultimately, the fact that that sacrifice was made on the 10th of Muharram, that because of that sacrifice, the ages of ignorance are now being dispelled to what we have as an Islam that is saved until the end of time. As we have these various levels, we can see that we can establish a number of meanings per every single verse based upon either a direction or an interpretation. As we conclude that point, we found that the subsequent verse poses a wonderful statement by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says that within this oath, within this series of oaths is a deep understanding for the one who wishes to know about it. 
After this, now we take the new verses on tonight's goal, insha'Allah. And that is where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins by discussing about three individual tyrannical groups. The first is by the name of Ad, the second is Thamud, and the third is under the leadership of Fir'aun. We are very much accustomed towards these three. We have heard about them on many occasions, and we know the prophets, messengers have been sent to these particular tribes and to these groups. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses these three groups primarily because He wants to show us that each of these three groups have a particular facet or a particular way in which their tyranny is upheld. Now interestingly we find as we go into the issue of Karbala, one of the beauties of the movement of Karbala, when we say beauty we need to take it in context, when we see the beauty of Karbala is that each and every single martyr on the 10th of Muharram is very individual. Every martyrdom is different from another martyrdom. Imagine now if we came and we recited the maqtal of the 10th of Muharram and every martyrdom was the same. Shah Qasim was the same to Ali Akbar, was the same to Ali al Azghar and so on and so forth. Of course it wouldn't detract from the story of Karbala. But the reason as to why we have such an emotional attachment towards this movement is because many of us can feel like we can relate in some way or another. If I am a mother or a father, I can relate in a particular way. If I am a brother, I can relate to another particular story, and so on and so forth. And similarly, in regards to the various stories within Qur'an, they are not chosen again at random. There is a particular purpose behind each story. And therefore, the reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen these three particular stories of various tyrannical rulers and groups is because their stories are particular to the story of Karbala and specifically to Yazid bin Muawiyah. Yazid, as we know, was the tyrant at that time. But if we see the movement of Karbala, we need to see each and every one of these particular tyrannical groups, what they represented, how they acted, and how this might be established in, for example, the rulerships of Yazid and Muawiyah themselves. And therefore we can see the movement in light of these. When we see these verses, in fact there is more than one that is dedicated towards this particular um, group of being Ad. We find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually mentions Ad based within three verses, verses 6, 7 and 8. He says, أَلَمْ تَرَ كَيْفَ فَعَلَ رَبُّكَ بِعَادِ Have you not considered how your Lord dealt with Ad? إِرَمَذَاتِ الْعِمَادِ The people of Irem possesses of lofty buildings. أَلَّتِي لَمْ يُخْلَكْ مِثْلُهَا فِي الْبِلَادِ The like of which were not created in any other cities. Now here we need to know two principles in Arabic grammar in order to understand how these three groups are all linked to each other and it is certain in the mind of someone who looks at it from a grammatical perspective that each of these three groups being Ad, Thamud and Fir'aun are linked all together. The first one is in regards to the letter Wow. Now we mentioned actually some depth um, the previous night about the letter Wow and we said that there is Wow Al-Qasam. Wow al-Qasam is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will use the letter wow and he will make an oath by this. For example, he will say wal asr, I swear by time, using this letter wow. But there is also a different usage in the Quran as towards the letter wow. There is also translated to be the word and. We often find that the word and is given to us by the letter wow. There are two different types of and that can be used within the Qur'an. One is called wow ataf and one is called wow isti'naf. Now this ataf and isti'naf are very particular. They have a very deep understanding and when you see these two types of and, when you know the difference between the two of them, you will be able to see a deep level of understanding within them. Ataf means connection. It means when something is joined together. Isti'naf means separation. So you either have a wow, an and, which joins 
sentences together, or you have a wow of istinaf which separates sentences one from another. So, for example, when we see these particular uh, qasam, when we see these particular oaths taken by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, wal fajr, wal layalin ashr, wal shaf'i wal watr. And we can see that these are wow for oaths. But here later on we see, for example, in verse number 9, وَثَمُودَ الَّذِي جَابُ الصَّخْرَ بِالْوَاد That this is an and, and Thamud, who used to hew out rocks within the valley. Here we can establish that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to join the stories of these particular tyrants together. He's not separating it. He's not saying, well, here's one tyrant, but here's someone who's really good, and therefore you need to separate the stories. By virtue of an and, being and of ataf, being wow of ataf, it joins these groups together. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that, uh, have you not considered ad, and you also get the wow of ataf and thamud, it's the same statement. Have you not considered thamud? And have you not considered fir'aun? And therefore when you have these ands in place, it joins all of the series of statements together. One. Two, the second way we know that they are all grouped together in their story is by the word alladhina. So in verse number 11 it says, alladhina taghaw fil bilad. So, have you not considered ad? They were arrogant. Have you not considered Thamud, what they did? Have you not considered Fir'aun, what he did? Alladhina taghaw fil bilad. All of these groups committed great inordinances within the cities. By virtue of the word alladhina, we join all of them together and we know that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to learn about these groups, He's not separating them in issues. He wants us to know that they are a group of people who are tyrannical and therefore the lesson should be taken from them relative to the story itself. As we go further now, we see that Ad were a particular group that have a particular series of lessons that we can take from them. And when we look at these lessons, we need to find one or two in particular that we can see were brought out in light of Muawiyah and Yazid. Because if we want to see how this story of Karbala moves within this chapter, we need to see that Ad, Thamud and Fir'aun have their own special dynamic towards this story. Tomorrow, inshallah, we'll take Thamud in depth. The following day, we'll take Fir'aun in depth. Tonight, we just look at Ad. When we look at Ad, the first thing to know is their background as to who they were and where they came from. The people of Ad were from the generations that were subsequent to the people of Nuh alayhi salam. As we know, Nuh alayhi salam was on his ark and the great flood came, destroyed the land and eventually Nuh alayhi salam was able to leave the ark and eventually the people would re-establish themselves within the land. We have a certain number of generations that are a gap between Nuh's people and the people of Ad. Some generations may say four or six or eight, but either way, we know that this group of people were eventually after Nuh alayhi salam. The prophet that was sent to them was by the name of Prophet Hud. Prophet Hud, we see that he has story, and Ad story is mentioned in a number of places within the Holy Quran. As an example, two chapters are named after this particular group of people. The first one, chapter number 11, Surah Al-Hud himself, or chapter of Hud, where Prophet Hud is dedicated towards the name. We also have the chapter Al-Ahqaf. Al-Ahqaf means the sand hills. And Al-Ahqaf is another chapter that is dedicated towards the history of Ad. Straight away we can see if 114 chapters are present within the Qur'an, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has named two of them dedicated towards this issue of the group of Ad, straight away there must be something great within this story. It's not a story that can be overlooked. There must be something deep within this for the lessons for you and I to take, and specifically in regards to the greatest movement history has ever known, being Karbara. In regards to Ad, where were they based? Geographically, they were very far. And geographically, they were spread out amongst a number of cities. But their region was primarily the region of modern-day Yemen. Yemen, as we know, is that strip of land which is adjacent towards modern-day Saudi Arabia. That is their primary area in which they lived. 
And therefore, the reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala specifies the story of Ad so much within the Qur'an is because the people of Arabia knew this story very, very well. Imagine now it's a story that you have been handed down generation after generation, much like we have within Karbala. Our mothers and our fathers may have told us this story. Our grandparents would have told us this story in the nights of Muharram and every time a shahada takes place, a Thursday night, we come and hear parts of this story. In Arabian culture, the story of Ad and Thamud was so famous that everybody was told about it constantly, one after another as a generation. And therefore, one of the reasons why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted this to be prescribed within Qur'an is because the people knew of this story. On this point, we find a very interesting point. Why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only mention 25 prophets within the Holy Qur'an? As in, we teach our children that they have how many prophets? 124,000. Why didn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mention the story of 45 prophets? Why didn't He mention 100 prophets within the Qur'an? Why only bring us to a total of 25? Ayatollah Shaheed al-Hakim, may Allah bless his soul, he has a statement within one of his books where he says, the reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala confined his stories towards 25 named prophets in Qur'an was because these 25 were the ones that the people of Arabia were accustomed to. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had revealed stories of other prophets from other lands, it may have been a reason to reject the Holy Qur'an. As in those people, the Bedouins of the time, or the people of the Quraysh of the time, or the Jews and the Christians would have questioned. They would have said, well, hang on a minute. We haven't heard this story of Prophet X, Y, and Z. We've never heard of Prophet A, B, and C in land A, B, and C. Therefore, you must be making these stories up. We reject your Qur'an. We reject your book as a book of revelation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could not give any reason in existence, in history, to reject the Qur'an. They needed to know it and become aware of it. But also stories that they could become attached to by virtue of them being aware of them. And therefore, Ad was a story that was there to shake the people. Because we will tell you of a story that you are so much aware of that you should not be rejecting this idea. It happened in your own country, this story. Even though Yemen we separate today as a new country, of course there wasn't a border between Yemen and Arabia in those days, and therefore you are well aware of this particular story. Here we go further. If we turn to chapter number 53, which is... Surah Al-Najm, verse number 50. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says something very interesting as an introduction to the story of Ad. He says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, وَأَنَّهُ أَهْلَكَ عَادَنِ ula And that he did destroy the people of Ad of old. عَادَنِ ula Now another translation for عَادَنِ ula may be Ad the first. Now this is key in terms of how Qur'anic tafsir and Qur'anic sciences work. When we find a statement by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of there being one, the fact that he specifies one, in Qur'an or in a hadith or in explanation, there must be two. The fact that he has mentioned Ad al-Ula, Ad of old or Ad of first, there must be a latter example of Ad coming into place. Now we have many evidences of this within Qur'an. As an example, in the verse of Tathir, we are very much aware of chapter 33, verse 33. <laughs> However, we need to know that that is not the entirety of the verse. As we know that there is a sentence in this verse, in chapter 33, verse 33, that supersedes the aspect of tahara and tathir. Right? There is a verse that says, or part of the verse, the beginning of the verse says, that you should not display your fineries. Just like the people of Ignorance of the first period. Jahiliyatil ula. Then after this statement, 
of a group of people who are displaying their fineries just like the people of Jahiliyyat al-Ula, the first age of ignorance, that's when the verse concludes with the verse of Tathir. Therefore, the question is, if there was a first age of ignorance, Ula, there must be a second period of ignorance within history. The fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts a first, there must be a second. So therefore the question is, when is the second? Principally, the scholars say that we are living in the second age of ignorance. In the idea that because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states that there are people who will present their fineries, their bodies, the things that should become personal to them, just as they were in the first era of ignorance, there is a period now when we look, turn on the TV, turn on the films, look at billboards all around us, the magazines, there are people who will display their fineries in such a way that we are living in a second age of ignorance. The fact that there is one, there is two. Another evidence within Quran for us to take can be the terms Nash'atil Ula and Nash'atil Akhirah. In Nash'atil Ula, this is the first creation. Again, we have Ula. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that we have created you from Nash'atil Ula. You know that there is a first creation. You know because you have been through that first creation. We were in our mother's wombs. We were given birth to. Therefore, this was the first ever creation. But the same way there is a Nash'atil Ula, in chapter number 29, verse 20, Allah says, We are going to have a Nash'atil Akhirah. We are going to have a letter creation. Therefore, know that latter creation is on the day of judgment. We will raise you from your graves. Therefore, the fact that there is one, there is always two mentioned in Quran, or at least there needs to be two in thought process. The fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that there is Adan al-Ula, a first Ad, there must be a second Ad as well. Now in Quran, there is nowhere that mentions a second Ad. There is nowhere in a hadith that will specify there is a second Ad. But by principles of how Qur'an works, there must be a second ad. And the fact that we have mentioned that all of these tyrannical rulers are joined together by virtue of wa'u atif and by virtue of the word allati lam yakhluk mithluha fil bilad when there is a first of ad, there must be a second of ad. When there is a first of thamud, there must be a second of thamud. When there is a first of fir'aun, there must be a, th- a second of fir'aun as well. Therefore, all of the first are mentioned clearly in Quran. But the second example of ad, the second example of thamud, and the second example of uh, fir'aun are indeed none other than Muawiyah and Yazid ibn Muawiyah. Does that make sense how the Qur'an works? When you have a first, you must have a second. You must have a second. Because Allah specifies there is a first. Therefore, by the example of how Qur'an works, there must be a second. And by virtue of joining these three tyrants together, the fact that Allah mentions there is a first of these, there must be a second of the others. Therefore, we need to see these characters in light of these issues of Ard, Thamud, and Fir'aun. That's a very in-depthful tafsir. And inshallah, everybody followed it and how we connect the dots and how tafsir works. And thus, when it comes to this particular group of Ard, they are very tyrannical. They have a specific type of tyranny within their hearts. And therefore, this specific type of tyranny is a basis in which how to work. What they have is they have an attitude. They have a thought process. They have a way in which they believe. And therefore, eventually, when you get to Thamud and Fir'aun, you have actions. But what you find with Ad and the people of Ad is that they have a systematic thought process. And therefore, what we find in Quran of their systematic thought process will be the examples of the systematic thought process of Muawi and Yazid. What is this systematic thought process? We find it within two particular verses of Qur'an. The first one is within chapter number 41, verse number 15. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now presents to us exactly what this group are actually like. As we said, chapter number 41 is Hamim Sajda. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala presents us with the following. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Then as Ta'ad, they were unjustly proud within the land. And they said, who is mightier in strength than us? Allah responds by telling them, did they not see that Allah who created them first was mightier than they in strength, but they denied our communications. The first problem with Ad was that they believed that they were mightier in strength than anybody else in the world. And because of that, they had such a level of arrogance where they were able to reject everyone and anyone that would come to them. What happened with their story? In regards to Ad, we find that their prophet that was sent to them was Hud. Hud, the name of Hud translated is the guided one. We have, for example, derivatives of this word. We have Hadi or we have Mahdi. These are derivatives of this word. Hud is the one who is guided. And he is the one who was sent in order to guide his particular group. When he was born, a story tells us that his mother, peace be upon her, had a vision about Prophet Hud. And that he was the one who was going to go through great trials and difficulty within his own time. We find this finds us a similarity in regards to the master of the martyrs, Abu Abdullah Hussein sallallahu alayhi wa One of the famous narrations tell us, Rasulullah, peace be upon him, and his family was out of the house. One of these servants within the house ran towards Rasulullah and said, Ya Rasulullah, there is a problem with Zahra. She has collapsed. Come towards her. When he comes running towards her, eventually she wakes and finds that she speaks to Rasulullah and says to him, the reason why I have collapsed is because of grief of what I have seen, what I have heard, what has taken place in front of me. Oh, my daughter Zahra, what is it that has taken place? My son, this son within my womb, he speaks to me. What does he say, oh Zahra? He cries out, Ana shaheed, I am the one who will be the martyr. And the second day the same thing happens, again he calls out. Traditions slightly differ, but one says, and al gharib I am the one who is all alone. And I am the one who will become thirsty. The same way that Hud alayhi salam, his mother was seeing a vision about Prophet Hud and the trials and tribulations that he would go through. Zahra sallallahu alayhi also saw and heard from her womb what would take place. One tradition tells us that Hud alayhi salam as a youth, he was one that never of course prostrated to any idol. As he approached his people, one of the things that they did to him, that they strangled Prophet Hud to the extent that he became unconscious for a day and a whole night. Hud alayhi salam, with his people with Ad, they had something that was very specific to their history. They were people who had lofty towers. This is why the verse says, ذات imad that they were the people of very lofty towers. Imad, according to some translations, isn't just lofty towers. It is lofty towers which are like tent pegs, which were able to go deep within the ground and very high up. One narration tells us that at their time, they had towers, buildings that they lived in, which were several stories high. Now today, for you and I, having... A building which is several stories high isn't anything necessarily grand. We don't look at it and say, wow, mashallah. But you can imagine thousands and thousands of years ago after the period of Nuh alayhi salam that to have a house and a building and a palace which was several stories high was of the grandest thing at the time. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala confirms this by saying, that, that of these people, there were none that had this kind of city. There was none that were able to create like this. Because they had such grand cities, number one, they felt arrogant. They felt that they had achieved so much because of what they had achieved with their own technologies. They were a group that used to have great farming lands. They were people of great agriculture almost as if akin to factories today. 
they were people, in terms of the history of anthropology and archaeology, they were people who would be able to grow a lot of things, and therefore they felt very proud of what they had achieved. Secondly, they felt very secure. They felt because we were the first people of our age in our area to grow such grand buildings that none can come and destroy us. The ending of them was based within this very arrogance that they had. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks in many verses that a great wind overtook them, that they actually ran for security within their great lofty buildings, and a great wind took them for seven days and for eight nights. It completely destroyed them. Hence the term in Quran, Al-Ahqaf. Al-Ahqaf being the sand hills. Because so much sand was sent upon them. Such a great dust storm was sent upon them that it was as if that their high several story buildings were covered by sand. And that's why you have the chapter Al-Ahqaf, the sand hills that covered the people of Ad. One day two caliphs of Banu Abbas had to deal with this. We find that they were people who had their own level of arrogance. Two in particular, Al-Mansur and Al-Mahdi. Al-Mansur started to dig a well within this area of Yemen. He dug and dug and dug and continued. Eventually he died. It so happened that the next caliph, Al-Mahdi, continued to dig and they dug until they managed to get towards the bottom of the well. When they got towards the bottom of the well, rather than water raising out, a wind came out. A wind that scared the people who were digging. They wrote a letter towards the caliph. The caliph said, continue to dig. He sent more diggers and eventually they created a well that was large enough for humans to drop down into. People went and dropped down and they began to dig further, going in and straight towards. When they dug, they wrote a letter back towards the caliph and said that we have seen something which we have never seen before. We have seen houses, grand, tall buildings, that have remained the way in which they were from thousands of years ago. But when we dug and we entered into these grand buildings, we found human beings that were dead, but they died in such a way as if they were died in a way in which they were still. When we touched them, they were covered with sand. As we touched them, the sand broke into pieces and their entire body scattered into pieces. He had never heard something like this. He read that letter and called our seventh Imam alayhi salam. The seventh Imam came and said, what do you ask? He says, we have seen these things. What are these things that we have seen? The seventh Imam said, do you not read Surah Al-Ahqaf? This is the sand hills which have taken place. This is Ad, have been destroyed. And this is the sand that has burst upon them. Another verse of Qur'an begins to discuss exactly what has taken place. And this is from Surah Al-Shu'ara, chapter number 26 of the Holy Qur'an, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends a second description of the people of Ad. He says within verse number 123 to verse number 130. And he says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Ad gave a lie to the apostles. When their brother Hud said to them, Will you not guard against evil? Surely I am a faithful apostle towards you. Therefore guard against the punishment of Allah and obey me. And I do not ask you any reward for it, except my reward is with Allah, the Lord of the worlds. Do you build on every height a monument? Vain is it what you do. And you make strong fortresses that perhaps you may abide within. And when you lay hands upon men, you lay hands upon them like tyrants. This is how you treat people. Not only are you arrogant in thinking that you are stronger than everybody else to the point in which you are willing to reject Allah, how you treat people is that you treat them like tyrants. Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to show us the poor qualities of these two of this particular group. That what they were like is how their attitude was towards people. 
the attitude of Muawiyah and Yazid here need to come into question to see how they were with towards the messengers and the people of their time. Because if you can see that this principal attitude was that they thought that they were better than anyone else, this is how Ad were, and this is with the presentation of these people as a group of human beings. We find so sorrowfully that an incident took place with Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan. Muawiyah, after the death of the commander of the faithful, Ali ibn Abi Talib, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, He called one of the grand companions of the commander of the faithful towards him. This particular companion was very elderly. And he was someone who actually had outlived his four sons. The reason why he had outlived his four sons was because his four sons had died in the battle of Siffin on behalf of the commander of the faithful against Muawiyah. So what he wanted to do was call this man and trick him into saying something bad about the commander of the faithful. Maybe he is upset with Ali because his four sons have died. He calls the old man and he says to him, I hear that you are someone who praises Ali so much. Therefore tell me why is it that you praise Ali like this? What is the reason? He wanted to get him rattled and angry about the death of his four children. The old man who was so old, his back was bent because of his age. But he used to wear one of those ropes that tied around his stomach. And he, in the narration, tied that and pulled it. Pulled it to the point where it became tight around his back and he was able to stand firm against Muawiyah. He says, should I tell you as to why I love Ali so much? Why I praise Ali ibn Abi Talib every single day? The reason why I praise Ali is because of the time in which I spent with him and what I saw of him. I will tell you of the face of Ali ibn Abi Talib. His face shone like it was a shining star to the point in which we could not even look at him directly in the face. When he smiled, his teeth shone like a row of pearls in front of us. Shall I tell you more of Ali, O Muawiyah? I will tell you that during the day he spent time with us as if he was one of us. And during the evening, he would be the one who would take account of himself and each and every one of his deeds. When he thought people were sleeping during the night, he would go and he would give the people food and look after them. This is why I praise Ali ibn Abi Talib so much. Muawiyah is narrated to have tears streaming down his eyes having heard the praise of his enemy Ali ibn Abi Talib The attitude of these people, the attitude of the tyrants were that they were greater than anyone else when really they were the lowest of the low that has ever been created. Our attitude... Our attitude is towards loving these people. And you find that many a times we are challenged about changing the mindset of an individual. We have come in these ten nights for the purpose of Islah, reformation within ourselves. And therefore to change the attitude of a tyrant is the most difficult of things. Once a caliph asked one of his servants, an advisor within his court. The court's advisor, the advisor's name was Ayyad. Ayyad was a very deep spiritual man. And when he was an advisor, he would always give the best of advice to the caliph. So the caliph said to him, Ayyad, advise me. Tell me how I can change my life, my attitude towards this situation. And he says to him, I'll present to you a scenario. Understand this scenario And you will, if you have deeply understood it, change everything about yourself and your life, your outlook. He says to him, imagine now you are going on a trip in a desert. Let's assume you're going on a hunting trip within the desert or you're going out. And you are with your party. And for whatever reason, you get separated from your party. 
It's happened to many of us. We go out and we get separated from our family members. And we think we are lost and so on and so forth. It has happened. And you imagine this scenario where you are separated from your party. And I am coming towards you. Due to your separation within the desert, of course, as you are walking, you would be to the point of thirst. I approach you and you are at the point in which you are now dying of thirst. And when you come towards me, you say to me, do you have any drink of water that can quench my thirst? Of course, I would say to you, O great caliph, I will present you with this water, but on a condition. I will give you this water, but on the condition that you give to me half of your kingdom. Would you do it? King, the caliph says, of course I would do it. If I need to have a drink of water in order to save my life from the thirst of the desert, in exchange for half of my kingdom, of course I'm going to give you half of my kingdom. So I will take. And then Ayaz continues. He says, O Caliph, if that's the case, once you drink that water, that water causes you an infection whereby you are unable to pass water and is giving you so much pain that you think you are going to die. You are unable to pass water. It is the most painful of disease. But with me in my group is a doctor who can cure you of your illness. But I was to say to you, I would not allow that doctor to come and give you a remedy unless and except you give me the other half of your kingdom. Would you do it? The caliph said, of course I would. If it meant I could pass that water and stop being in such great pain, of course I would give you the other half of the kingdom. Ayyad looks at him and says to him, O oh, caliph, woe be upon you and your attitude towards your superiority within this world. You think that you are so great. You think your position is of such high stature. The reality is in your eyes, your entire kingdom isn't worth one glass of water to you. You would be willing to exchange your entire kingdom for one glass of water. Why then do you think that you are such a lofty king in the eyes of this world? You see the attitude of a tyrant and how they really perceive themselves and how they really are. And ultimately, Yazid was of exactly the same nature. If Ad felt that they were the most superior in the land, there is no strength like our strength. What attitude Yazid had towards Hussein ibn Ali? Imagine where you have the audacity that you can behead the grandson of Rasulullah. Nay, it does not stop there. Imagine now you are presented with that head and you have the audacity to be able to poke a stick at that head. Imagine it does not, const- it does not stop there. Imagine he has the capability, the audacity to place that head on a chessboard and on that chessboard next to him is a glass of alcohol. And in his drunken state, he is capable of knocking over that glass of alcohol. And alcohol mixes with the blessed blood of Hussein ibn Ali. Is this man not an example of the most arrogant tyrant history has ever seen? Is this not an example of the people of Ad where they said to themselves that none has strength like us? But Allah says in Quran, We are the ones who created you in the first place. Do you not think that we have strength over you? And when you hear a story like this, your heart cannot help but have such grief and pain for the state of such tyrants. Your heart cannot bear but bleed and shed these great tears for Hussein ibn Ali. We want to tell you a story and understanding what it is like to be a true lover and companion of Hussein ibn Ali. The night tonight we are commemorating is that of Habib ibn Madahir. Habib is a companion, an individual who one really cannot fathom. One doesn't really have the ability to understand. And the grief in which he would have showed towards Hussein maybe, just maybe, can be understood in this particular story. It's once said that Ayatollah Hakim, may Allah bless his soul, was sitting and he would receive delegations 
And one person would come to him day after day after day. And this particular person would come three days in a row. And he came with the same question day after day. He comes to him and on the first day he says to him, Oh, Ayatollah Hakim, I have heard that the imams used to shed tears of blood over the death of Hussein ibn Ali. Is this true? As in we hear it, don't we? Imam Zain al-Abideen used to shed tears of blood. We hear that the 12th Imam in his ziyarat shed tears of blood for Hussein ibn Ali. O oh, Ayatollah Hakim, is this the case? He says to him, indeed we have come across this in the books. So the second day this man comes back towards Ayatollah Hakim and asks exactly the same question. Is it true our imams shed blood? Maybe he is not satisfied. He wants another answer. He wants evidence. Again, Ayatollah Hakim responds with exactly the same statement. We have read this within the books. The third day he comes back to Ayatollah Hakim and he says to him, Is it true the imams shed tears for Hussein ibn Ali? At this point, Ayatollah Hakim cannot respond with exactly the same answer. There is nothing in which he can say if it's the same that will give satisfaction towards this man's answer. Ayatollah Hakim bows his head and begins to weep profusely. He takes a handkerchief out of his pocket and dabs his eyes. He puts that handkerchief towards the man and says, Oh man, I cannot speak for the imams because I was not there. But my handkerchief has tears of blood. Maybe I... I'm able to show you through my tears of blood that yes, indeed, the imams were able to shed the tears. I cannot prove to you, but maybe my one example will show you of the pain of someone who truly loves Hussein ibn Ali. Imagine Habib ibn Madahir, when he received that letter from Imam al-Hussein, which said to him, O Habib, you are a scholar and a jurist. You are a free man. You know our lineage and you know my proximity towards Rasulullah. Therefore, come to my aid. Habib ibn Madahir, as a young child, was someone who was in love with Hussein ibn Ali. The narrations tell us that he used to follow Imam everywhere he would go. One tradition tells us that Rasulullah used to see Habib's father, Madahir. And at one point, he wept and wept in front of Mudahir. Mudahir said to him, O Rasulullah, why do you cry? He says, I have just seen your son Habib. He follows my son Hussein everywhere he goes. This young son of yours will even follow Hussein and protect him on the day of Ashura. And indeed, Habib moved with Imam Ali alayhi salam when he went towards Kufa and he followed Imam al Hussein at that time and there he was waiting. In fact, the narrations tell us that the very first letter that was received by Imam al Hussein alayhi salam in Medina was that letter from Habib ibn Nadahir. And then Imam is in the plains of Karbala. He has sent that letter towards Habib. Habib comes and he says to his servant that we must now leave. His wife says to him, what are you waiting for? The grandson of Hussein, the grandson of Rasulullah has called you. Go towards him, go towards him. Habib knows how much of a difficult time it is in Kufa. How the tyrants are within Kufa at that time. He says to his servant, I want you to take my horse and take it outside of the grounds of Kufa and wait for me there. If people say to you, why is it that you are there? Tell them that you are grazing your horse. Habib now goes and he waits for a time in which the mosque of Kufa is filled, maybe at prayer time. And at that time he leaves and he sneaks out of the city of Kufa. He comes towards that servant of his and he says to him, I free you in the name of Allah. Go and flee this evil city. The servant responds and says to him, O Habib, my master, please tell me that you are now going towards Hussein, the grandson of Rasulullah, to assist him in this time. 
Why is it that you are telling me to flee and to become free at this point? Do you deny me the opportunity to go and serve the son of the daughter of Rasulullah? Why are you allowed to have this action and this blessing but you deny me of this? At this point, Habib begins to cry and says to himself, if this is such a great response, how can I deny him? He tells the servant, come with me, we will go towards the plains of Karbala. At this point, Imam Hussain alayhi salam is handing out the standard. He is now handing out the standard and one is left. There is one in which is available. They ask him, Ya Hussein, Ya Rasul, Ya Ibn Rasulullah, O oh Master, tell me, who is this one standard that is left available for? Imam responds back by saying, This standard is for Habib. There is a man who is going to come. And indeed, at this point in time, the narrations tell us that a cloud of dust could be seen. And that cloud of dust was coming closer and closer towards the tents. Indeed, that it was Habib ibn Mudahir. Habib was about the same age as Rasulullah, a great companion of his. He comes and he meets, uh, he comes and meets Aba Abdullah, and he comes and there is a great commotion that is made outside the tents. They are coming and giving their salutations towards him. They are coming and giving him a pat on the back and saying to him, Habib, thank you. Oh, great Habib coming to our aid and coming to the aid of uh, the grandson of Rasulullah. At this point, this commotion is heard by Sayyid Zainab. Imagine Sayyid Zainab hearing this commotion. She is the one who is going out towards the companions and saying to them, Make sure you defend the grandson of Rasulullah tomorrow. Imagine what commotion she would have heard when Habib came. She comes and says, Who is it that has come outside? They tell her this is Habib. She says, Pass my salutations towards Habib. At this point, Habib hears this this salutation that has been passed towards him. He responds by saying, Ah, woe be upon this man. Who is this low individual who receives the salutations from such a great lady as Sayyid Zainab? How can I be given such great salutations? Habib was a leader upon that day, one of the grand companions that would attack the enemies. Traditions tell us that he attacked and killed many of the enemies. One of the traditions tell us that at this point in time, he continues to come towards the grandson of Rasulullah. He says to him, O oh my master Hussein, please allow me to go and fight upon your behalf. Imam responds to him and says, O oh Habib, you are such such a close friend of mine. You are such a dear friend. How can I bear to let you go out? If you go out, my closest friend, my ally will be taken from me. I cannot bear to see that you are departing from me. But at this point, the battle begins to rage and Habib continues to ask. At this point, it comes to the time of Salat al dhuhr One companion comes towards the Imam and says to him, Ya ibn Rasulullah, the time of prayer has come. Let us come and perform our prayers. He says to him, congratulations to you. May Allah make you amongst those who have established the salah. At this point, one of the enemies by the name of Hussein calls out to the grandson of Rasulullah and says to him, O oh Hussein, do you think your prayers are going to be accepted? Habib shouts out in a fit of rage, O oh man, O oh drunkard, do you think that your prayers prayer will be accepted before the grandson of Rasulullah. Nay, you will enter into the pitfalls of hell. At this point, he begins to abuse and curse Habib. Habib turns towards Hussein and says, Oh my dear friend Hussein, I wish to go and pray my salah within the seven heavens. I wish to be praying my salah behind Rasulullah and behind Ali ibn Abi Talib. Allow me to enter into the battlefield. Hussein gives his great 
defend the permission to go and enter into the battlefield. He comes and strikes the enemy like a great lion. Well, one tradition says that one man comes to him with a sword. He lifts that sword towards his head and strikes the head of Hazrat Habib. Habib's head is split open and blood gushes forth. But the end does not stop here for Habib. He falls towards the floor. Another man picks up a spear and thrusts it into the chest of Habib. Habib calls out towards his grand friend Hussein, Peace be upon you. Assalamu alaykum ya Aba Abdullah. Accept my final salutation at this point. Aba Abdullah comes and sits beside Habib. Habib, you are my greatest of companions since my young age. Oh Habib, how difficult it is for me to sit see you in this scenario. At this point, Habib begins to waver from this world to the next. When he passes away, Hussein lets out a deep cry. He says, Oh Habib, indeed you are the one who used to recite the Quran, the whole Quran in a night. Oh Habib, you are the one who used to recite a thousand prayers within the night. But then it does not stop for Habib. The enemies do not leave the body of Habib alone. One man comes and beheads Habib. One man separates the head from Hazrat Habib. But now it is narrated that Habib's head was treated differently to the heads of all of the other shuhada. All of the other shuhada, their heads were placed higher upon a spear. Example, one narration says to us that when the heads were taken towards Damascus, one of the great ladies came towards the enemy tyrants and said, Please, we ask that you put the heads of our family members at the front so they can be observed. We, the women of Ahlul Bayt, do not want ourselves to be seen. We would rather the heads of Hussein and Akbar and must be seen than our own selves. At this point, the narration tells us that the head of Habib was treated differently to everybody else. The head of Habib, it was not placed upon a spear. They placed the head of Habib and they hung it from in front of the horse. They hung it from the horse and then it dragged along the ground so that when the enemies, they left the plains of Karbala, the horse's hooves were stepping on the head of Hazrat Habib. They were kicking the head of Hazrat Abib all the way towards the cities of Kufa and Damascus. And at one point, a young son, a young man by the name of Qasim. Qasim was a young son of Hazrat Habib. When they entered into those cities, Qasim came towards that man who was sitting on that horse. He comes to him and he stands in front of that horse. He looks and continues to stare at the head. He continues to stare at the head of his great father. He says to him, please give me this head so I can bury this head properly. The head of Habib looked back at his son as if to say, oh my son Qasim, how can you consider my head first and want to bury my head whilst the head of Hussein is still upon a spear? But we ask you, oh young Qasim, if you looked at the head of your father Habib like this, what did little Sakina have to put up with when the head of Hussein was sitting upon a spear. Allah Allah Anatullah Yaradhamidameen. Musayalum Ladina Dalamu Ayuman Kalabi and Kalibun in Narillah wa in Nailehi Rajaun. Oh Allah, we seek your forgiveness for all of our sins, the sins of our parents, all those whom we love, all those that love us. We ask you, Ya Allah, for the opportunity to perform the ziyarat of Hazrat Habib and all the companions. We ask you, Ya Allah, whatever situation we are going through, be we going through spiritual problems, health problems, financial problems, grant us the shafa and the intercession of Hazrat Habib, Matami Hussein, Ya Hussein.